Good evening, and welcome to Dr. Peace Theater. Tonight we continue our dive into Stones to Abigail. Oh yes, we had just left Lakewood High. James, wearing nothing but his socks, ran into the building to save Abby. James never found her. Chapter 8 <clears throat> Lakewood High struggled at first. We all did. But as promised, the school was operating once again and welcoming students back. Abby had returned home a few days prior, telling me how much crap she was going to give her dad for up and abandoning her for so long. But we both knew he rarely showed any interest in what she had to say. I suppose we both liked to think of our fathers in a way that made us feel like they could care from time to time. In a strange way, we both, felt, we both felt safer after the incident, knowing someone who had beaten Abby, someone who had terrorized her life, now was completely unable to harm her life. Or anyone's life, for that matter. We've learned she barely survived Jason's beatings, but was left in a coma, according to the news reports in both the papers and on TV. On our first day back, reporters from all over the country and even a few countries outside the U.S. gathered around the school to witness our recovery process. Shootings had become so common in the country, but ours was regarded as particularly significant due to the fact Seth had claimed a staggering 52 lives, leaving only four of the people he shot still alive. All those lives, connected directly to countless family members, friends, all now subjected to a heightened risk for depression and statistically even suicide. Seth had directly taken so many, but the collateral damage was done and beyond what any of us could likely imagine. Signs on the new school doors instructed us to gather in the gymnasium. I headed to Abby's class to catch her so we could sit together. She was smiling and gave me a warm hug from behind. She said, you're always there for me. I have no idea what I'd do without your hair. I replied, You don't have to worry about that, Abby. At this point, you're basically a core section of my programming. She smiled. There you go again with all your robot talk. I smiled as I walked down the hall with my arm around her. As we entered the gymnasium, the only noise I could hear was the shuffling bags and the banging of shoes against the bleachers. Barely anyone was talking, and most everyone just looked concerned outside a couple small groups who were the only quiet ones out of respect for the situation. Many of the students had not arrived at school yet, or were evacuated before they could see anything. The amount of psychological damage avoided by that reality alone gave me a sense of comfort. Just knowing people with gruesome images in their head that day, absorbed firsthand, were in the minority, felt like a small victory. Abby and I sat next to Davis, who looked more upset than I had ever seen him. He looked up at me and somehow found a way to still mumble off. Hey, buddy. Still nice to see you. I smiled and looked on, waiting for the administration to begin speaking. A man in a long black coat and suit walked out and introduced himself. Hello, I am Ronald Richoff. I have been assigned by the President of the United States to address incidents like the one in your school and what it has bravely endured. We remained silent as he continued. I'm not going to fill this room with empty idealistic words. Even if I did, many of you would identify them for what they are. Complete and utter, utter political nonsense utilized poorly as a means to save face. He paused and cleared his throat. Our president believes in transparency and remaining relevant to reality. 
not deluding events to appear as some act of unexplicable influence. This was a school shooting. One like many of the shootings you have heard about, and while it may appear pessimistic in your minds that the government is doing nothing to make changes so this will not happen again to another group on such a significant scale, I want you all to stop for a moment and think of your cell phones, clocks, televisions, and computers. What you see on the outside is rarely the full story. What you see is only on the surface. The illusion created to make us believe simplicity surrounds us. But underneath this thin shelf, this illusion, dwells a massive and complex system that is working to achieve a goal. Every single event begins us emotionally and gets us mentally closer to absolute intolerance. We will not rest till drastic measures are taken to help prevent tragedies like this from occurring. With many of you have already reached the point of complete intolerance, having seen this heinous crime unfold firsthand, much of the rest of the country fails to empathize. They have not lost friends, they have not lost teachers, or had their entire lives thrown into chaos. They are fortunate to have the luxury of ignorance as an option, but their luck can become a burden to the rest of us. Their obvious state can only hurt like many of you who are living the reality but have no choice but to accept. In closing, the President has decided to speak to each and every individual class later this week. It is not a photo opportunity. There will be no press in the rooms. The President of the United States has made a personal decision to single-handedly single -handedly handle your questions and concerns, to help in whatever way he can. There were many sounds of indistinguishably surrounding the gymnasium. Many of us never imagined we would be able to be seeing the president in person, let alone be able to talk to him. Mr. Mr. Richoff continued, I would like now to direct your, you to the screens on each wall to your left and right, where you will be hearing from someone many of you know and care for. The lights darkened as the projectors shining a school logo on the walls went blank. Distorted now, illuminated the screens as if the inputs were being shifted. The screen immediately revealed my gym teacher, Mr. Mack, sitting back in his partially tilted upright hospital bed with a bandage over his face and another covering the side of his chest. Gasps rang out all over the gymnasium, many covering their eyes to momentarily escape leaving their minds seconds to process and accept the state of the school's most beloved instructors. The screen immediately after revealed my gym teacher, Mr. Mack, sitting back in his partially tilted upright hospital bed with a bandage over his face and another covering the side of his chest. Gasps rang out all over the gymnasium, many covering their eyes to momentarily escape, leaving their minds seconds to process and accept the state of the school's most beloved instructors. Mr. Mack had refused to speak to reporters since the incident, and most everyone was just glad to see he had, at the very least, survived. He began to speak. Students of Lakewood High, you can see me, but in this room... I'm just talking to a camera. I'll do my best to get through what's been running through my mind the past few days that I've been unconscious. He paused, looking down, beyond the side of his bed. He was, no doubt, imagining the fear that a lot of us felt. Mr. Mack wasn't like a lot of teachers who divided themselves emotionally from those he educated. He most often treated us as if he was one of us and, while we loved him for it, we still respected him enough to recognize his authority. Resuming eye contact with the lens, Mr. Mack resumed. As you can imagine, under my bandages are gunshot wounds. The bullet was, no doubt, intended for the center of my forehead. Instead, instead it shattered bones on the side of my face. The bullet that wounded my side was meant to hit my heart. I consider myself fortunate. The reason, obviously, that I am in this state 
is because I directly encountered the gunman, and in my case, attempted to disarm him. Despite the initial gunshot to the side of my face, I was able to hasten my approach towards the gunman. I was shot in the shoulder instead of my heart, due to the irregular movements I made in my attempts to take his weapon away. As a result, I was able to snatch the M16 this young man was armed with, and I used the butt of the rifle to impact his windpipe. When I smacked his windpipe, I quickly recoiled and repeatedly hit his arm as he went for his secondary weapon. I'm not sure how much damage I did, but I did my best. The student's in awe, completely taken in by his story, as he continued, Seth, the gunman, began scrambling away from me before I could fire, before he could disable his ability to further harm anyone. I, unfortunately and regrettably, I lost consciousness. Mr. Max's facial expression shifted, making his disappointment in himself evident. Mr. Max struggled heavily in attempts to speak further. We all sat silently and respectfully as he found the words. I was told that the only people who were shot after crossing me were survivors. The four students who were only wounded, I was informed, likely lived because of his inability to properly aim the only revolving weapon he had armed himself with. His disability was a result of the damage I had inflicted on his neck and arm and his own weapon. He became silent as the information engulfed the room. In only seconds, the entire room roared to life with bone-shaking cheers. We had realized many of us owed our lives to Mr. Mack, that without him, Seth would have been able to continue using his automatic rifle, the very same rifle that claimed many lives lost that day. There was no telling where we would be without Mr. Mack's bravery and self-sacrifice. After moments of cheering, Mr. Mack continued, As you may have heard on the news, the gunman had planted explosives around the premises that he planned to detonate once he ran out of ammunition. These explosives would have had an effect similar to what you would expect of napalm and no doubt would have destroyed most everything within the school itself. Over the last couple of weeks, authorities have repeatedly scanned the premises with canine units and detection equipment to ensure the school offers an even safer environment as it did before. I hope all of you will continue to be strong through this hard time, and I need you all to... Mr. Mack paused. Looking off to the side again, he continued, I wanted every single one of you to know, I'm very sorry for all your irreplaceable losses. I also want to thank Jason. He, as you are all very well aware, was able to bring this event to an end. He is certainly one of the bravest among us. Mr. Mack finished speaking, and the projectors returned to the school logo. The principal of the school approached the center of the stadium and ensured us school would continue as normal. He went through a speech on what the nation has learned about the shootings and how we can all better educate each other on helping friends who were experiencing symptoms of PTSD. We were then excused to an early lunch after being told we would finish up the day as we normally would once lunch was over. Abby and I held hands at every opportune moment throughout the morning as Davis hung close by, talking about what was going through his mind during Mr. Mack's speech. He also mentioned our bus driver's ongoing battle with his work regarding the damages done to our bus as a result of his evacuation efforts during the shooting. It was amazing anyone could be so concerned with the financial impact so soon after the tragedy. To charge anyone for financial damage done as a result of his or her attempts to save students' lives, it just made no sense to me. Abby and I returned to gym class to find most everyone present, outside Raymond and our gym teacher. Raymond wasn't injured in the shooting, 
so we just assumed he wasn't ready to return to school yet. I sometimes got the feeling that Raymond was an intimidation of what he thought people wanted him to be. On the outside, he was tough and rebellious, but deep down I imagined he was likely a sensitive guy, afraid of being rejected upon opening his true self up to the world around him. The substitute gym teacher walked out and asked me, asked us to do whatever we wanted with the spare equipment they had. He then tossed basketballs, rackets, and other game equipment towards the center of the gym. Abby and I weren't all in the mood to play any sports or other games, so we decided to just sit and scribble pictures on each other's hands. Not many students played much of anything during class. Most of the equipment just sat in the middle of the gym. We were all still processing the earlier speeches and dealing with how different everything felt. No matter what they said or did to our school from that point, it would always remind us of death. When this book is finished, I have so many things I want to say, but that'll have to wait. This has been Dr. Peace Theater, and my name is Dr. Dennis Business, and as always, my friends.